Welcome to Canada's most irreverent talk show. This is The Andrew Lawton Show, brought to you by True North. Coming up, Conservative leadership candidate Pierre Polyev stops by for a wide-ranging discussion about why he's running and what he's going to do if he wins. The Andrew Lawton Show starts right now. Hello and welcome to you. This is Canada's most irreverent talk show here on True North, Friday, March 11th, 2022. Doing things a little bit different on the show today from how we normally do them because we are starting an unofficial series as we kick off the conservative leadership race and our coverage of it, talking to the candidates, having in-depth, substantive conversations about who they are, why they're running, what it is they want to do, not just as leader of the Conservative Party, but also if they win this race and then win the general election as Prime Minister. And as I've mentioned in the past, I'm not going to get immersed in the horse race of, oh, who's polling this much and who's polling this little and, ooh, what did this person do at a town hall in Burnaby South or something like that. But we are going to talk to the candidates. We are going to cover the races. And we're going to talk about some of the big picture ideas right now that are in the battle for the hearts and minds of the Conservative Party of Canada members. And we are going to be having an in-depth series of one-on-one in-person interviews with all of the candidates. At least we're going to invite all of them once the race is fully in gear. But in the meantime, we're going to be talking to the candidates as they launch, getting them to give a sense of why they're running. And the first candidate to announce very quickly after, basically days after there was an opening for Conservative Party of Canada leader, was Pierre Polyev, longtime Conservative Member of Parliament from Carleton. I think I last spoke to him in Carleton during the 2021 election. But Pierre Polyev joins me now. Pierre, always good to talk to you. Thanks for coming on today. Great to be with you, Andrew. Let's start with your campaign here. You were out of the gate very quickly and a very ambitious slogan for your campaign. It was Pierre for prime minister. So you're already bypassing the conservative leadership in some ways and you're running against Trudeau, right? Well, the end game is to become prime minister, give Canadians back control of their lives by making Canada the freest place on earth. Um, So my view is uh, let's just tell it like it is. That's my plan. That's my purpose. And that's why I'm running. When you look at the Conservative Party's trajectory, specifically since 2015, that was when you went from having a majority government under Stephen Harper to Justin Trudeau winning with a majority, and then you go to the subsequent elections since then, where do you feel is the benefit that you're going to bring and you can bring to the party as leader that will correct what's happened in those last three elections? Well, I'm going to win the election on the issue of cost of living. Um, The Canadian people feel like they've lost control of their lives. And the reason is that the average Canadian can't choose where they live anymore because the typical house costs $836,000, meaning you have 32-year-old men and women living in their parents' basement or permanently uh, renters uh, paying someone else's mortgage. They can't choose where they eat or what they eat anymore because of food price inflation. And uh, so you have single moms who can't choose the foods they want to put on their children's plates. Um, And then, of course, they can't choose where to go. Freedom of mobility mobility is gone when you can't afford a buck 80 a liter or two dollar a liter gas. So um, uh, with the carbon tax that Jean Charest uh, and Jean and uh, Justin Trudeau brought in um, and the uh, increases in the sales tax that Charest imposed on hardworking Quebecers, Um, People feel like they've lost control of their money. Um, I want to give people back control of their lives. Uh, I will counter what I'm calling just inflation. uh, And I'll do it three ways. One, I'll get rid of the carbon tax. Two, I'll rein in government spending so that we no longer print cash to pay our bills. And three, I'm going to unleash the productive forces of our economy to produce more energy, uh, build more houses, and grow more nutritious food. In other words, instead of creating more cash, let's create more of what cash buys. Uh, And when we do that, we'll have more affordable goods that will protect the purchasing power of paychecks. That is the single most important issue in Canada's suburbs, and I will win a majority government on that issue. 
cost of living important, inflation important, no argument for me there. Just to go back to the question I asked, though, I, I asked how you would bring the Conservative Party to a different result than the last three elections. And looking at Andrew Scheer's campaign in 2019, Aaron O'Toole's campaign in 2021, they did seem like campaigns that defaulted to what I think is the, the safe Conservative position of let's focus on the pocketbook issues, let's focus on cost of living. Why do you think that message is going to be something that resonates more this time around than it did the last two times? Do you think the climate's different, or do you think that the predecessors that you would like to follow weren't selling it all that well? I think that the climate is definitely different. Um, the inflation is at a 30-year high. Housing inflation is at record highs, uh, and energy prices are more expensive than they've ever been. Uh, why is that happening? Well, one thing is the, gov the cost of government is driving up the cost of living. Uh, you know, when governments overspend, then they have to overtax, and that drives up the cost of everything. The cost of money printing, which means the government has put $400 billion of new cash out into the economy, and that those dollars have gone out and bid up the price of goods and services, um, and to the benefit of the very rich at the expense of the working class wage earner. And then third, regulatory red tape blocks production. So we're, it's, it's, we're, 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 the governments are ballooning demand without uh, allowing the free market to match with supply. So um, I'm the only candidate who has any credibility on this issue. Of course, uh, Patrick Brown supports a carbon tax uh, after saying he wouldn't. And Jean Charest brought in a carbon tax, a fuel tax, a sale tax, sales tax hike in Quebec. I, look, I can't even imagine us running in suburban Canada on the issue of cost of living with a leader who raised the sales tax. Uh, Trudeau hasn't even yet done that. Um, and he will, obviously, but he hasn't yet done it. Um, and that would put us at a major strategic advantage, disadvantage. If I'm leader, I have a record of cutting the cost of living by lowering the GST uh, and fighting and, and pushing other tax cuts through parliament. So I'm the only candidate that can make Canadians' paychecks go further and counter what I call just inflation. You mentioned Jean Charest and Patrick Brown. So let's talk about the internal race here in the Conservative Party. A lot of the time, I mean, everyone knows the saying, the big blue tent, and underneath that, you've got your red Tories, your blue Tories, your libertarians, your social conservatives, your foreign policy people, your popular. I mean, you have all of these different people here. Where do you fit yourself? And more importantly, what are you going to do to keep that tent together, to keep that family happy, which, as we've seen in the last couple of years, isn't always a given? Where do I fit? I'm a conservative, a real conservative. And I haven't left the conservative party to become a liberal uh, for a decade like uh, Jean Charest did. I'm a conservative. Um, how do I keep them all, everyone together? Well, let's break it down. Um, and let's focus on the principle that unites all the different groups that you just listed. And that principle is freedom. So progressive conservatives want women, gays, minorities, immigrants, First Nations to have the freedom to pursue their own path and achieve their potential free from discrimination. Fiscal conservatives want economic freedom, that is control over your own money, the ability to start a business unimpeded by government gatekeepers. Social conservatives want religious freedom to raise their kids with their own traditional values and preach their faith without censorship. Rural and firearms uh, conservatives want the freedom to own their own property legally without undue government confiscation or penalties, like when Jean Charest supported the long gun registry uh, that wasted a billion dollars. Uh, and so if you look across the board at all of the different branches of conservatism, all of them, the many, they disagree on many things, but they all agree on one thing, and that is that we need more freedom. That's why I'm running for prime minister to put people back in control of their lives and make Canada the freest country on earth. In the last election in particular, we saw a lot of people who went to the People's Party of Canada, who admittedly many of them were traditionally not conservative voters or traditional non-voters, but a lot of them were disgruntled conservative voters who didn't feel, especially on vaccine mandates and vaccine passports, the conservatives were doing enough. And I, I know you have taken a, a very firm position, especially in recent weeks, against vaccine mandates and vaccine passports. And I, I reported on the letter you sent to Justin Trudeau this week saying, 
saying as much, but more broadly, is re-engaging PPC members with the Conservative Party, bringing people in that have in the past thrown in the towel on, on your party, is that a priority for you if you're the leader? And how do you do that? Well, I do welcome people from the People's Party back into the Conservative Party. Um, these are good. The, the the average PPC voter that I met on the doorsteps in the last election were concerned about uh, losing freedoms, and it turned out that was a legitimate concern. Uh, so I'm. That's why I said earlier we can unite a conservative coalition around freedom, uh, the freedom to make your own bodily and health decisions, the freedom to control your money. Uh, the freedom of speech and uh, of commerce, those freedoms will bring many people back to the fold who hadn't been in our party uh, in the past or who had, who had strayed away because they were um, dissatisfied. Uh, I think people, Andrew, feel like they've lost control of their lives. I see that when I talk to people, whether it's the excessive government, uh, the, the pandemic power trip, as I call it, the van vaccine man vendetta, or whether it's economic issues like people can't afford to choose where to live, what to eat or, or, or where to drive. Uh, th those pe people that feel like they're losing control of their lives, I'm going to reverse that trend. I'm gonna bring in more freedom through less government so that people control their own destinies and Canada's the freest country on earth. Let's talk a little bit about your competition specifically. You've mentioned Jean Charest a, a few times here. Here's a guy, again, took the position of leading the progressive conservatives back when, when that party existed, went into Quebec politics as a liberal, ha has come back now. Do you think that he is someone who at all is someone that you need to be worried about or someone that you see as a formidable opponent? Do you think that the idea of him even being in this race is, is a joke? Because you're, you're being very dismissive of him. I'm not saying you don't have a reason to with uh, the litany of, of policies you mentioned in Quebec, but do you see him as a, a legitimate opponent in this race? I always uh, view every candidate uh, as a legitimate um, contender. Uh, and uh, so um, I never take anything for granted. I just respectfully disagree with Jean Charest's liberal policies. Charest increased the sales tax twice in Quebec by over two percentage points, making life more expensive for customers. Uh, hardworking people uh, see their paychecks purchasing power go down because of Charest's tax hikes. He raised the carbon tax, the fuel tax, the health, another health tax. Um, hard to think of a single tax he hasn't raised. Um, I'm for lower taxes. And that is, I think, the big disagreement between Mr. Charest and I. He's for high taxes, and big government. I'm for low taxes, and small government. Uh, he also supported the billion dollar liberal long gun registry, which uh, went after law abiding duck hunters and farmers uh, rather than targeting um, violent criminals, gun smugglers, and gangsters. Uh, so I, I, again, disagree with his liberal approach to that. Um, so it's an honest um, but amicable uh, policy disagreement uh, that uh, will animate our debate in this leadership. You've talked about your position on, on Jean Charest, on, on Patrick Brown, just to complete the set here of the candidates who we know are, are going to be in this race. What's your view of Leslin Lewis? I think she's a great Canadian. Uh, I uh, admire her work and I've enjoyed uh, getting to know her a little bit. I don't know her that well, but I have gotten to know her a little bit on Parliament Hill. And uh, what I have seen is a, a good, hardworking and extremely intelligent uh, Canadian. She obviously appeals to the social conservative wing of the party. And you mentioned earlier, this is a, a wing that your view is, is seeking religious freedom, the right to make their own decisions. And I know this comes up in every single election. And I know the media obsesses about this. But I also know that it's of concern to conservative members who are socially conservative and other members, how a party is going to do that. So specifically, what is it that you will offer socially conservative voters that come to you and they say, I'm pro-life. This is a big issue for me. It's why I'm in the Conservative Party, because I've always felt like I have a home here. What's your pitch to that voter? Freedom. Uh, I believe that people of faith should have the freedom to espouse their faith. Uh, they should have the freedom to teach their kids their own values. And my policies will uh, recognize that freedom. I'm not proposing legislation on abortion. 
I'm being very honest about that up front. I'm not going to promise something during the leadership that I uh, cannot deliver on and that I will not deliver on after the leadership. But what I will propose are ways that we can uh, help women who want and who have chosen to put up their child for adoption. Um, I'm personally adopted myself. I think the system, both of for maternity benefits and for, for other uh, benefits and supports could be made fairer uh, to help uh, those women who choose adoption uh, with the costs and the struggles that come along with that choice. So that's what real free choice means. It means that, uh, that all different choices are supported and then that uh, a woman can des decide which uh, choice she wants to make. Um, and I think that kind of approach which enables and empowers women is um, the best approach uh, in a free and democratic country. You mentioned a couple of moments ago that you're not going to make a pledge in the leadership that you then roll on in the future. Let's talk about what happened in a lot of people's eyes during the last election when Aaron O'Toole, who had run on a very red meat, true blue conservative platform, had promised, and we, we spoke about it on this very program, defunding CBC was one notable example. Uh, scrapping the carbon tax was another. And those two were seen, and also firearms, uh, repealing the Liberal government's order in council prohibiting a number of variants of firearms and all three of those by the end of the campaign were not represented in what the conservatives were seeking so what's the accountability measure that you can offer how do people know that you're not going to do what's been done before very recently when you make these commitments in the leadership race well look at my past andrew you, you have to you, you look back at my 17 years in parliament i've been extremely consistent on those policy issues. I opposed the long gun registry, voted to repeal it again and again and again. I opposed the carbon tax. I voted against it in parliament when it came up and I'd never wavered or flip-flopped on that, on that issue either. Basically everything you see me running on in this platform now is what I've been running on and fighting for for 17 years um, and you'd be hard pressed to find any examples uh, uh, to the contrary. Um, by contrast, I know Mr. Brown, for example, he ran for the PC leadership in Ontario, promising that he would be a true blue conservative. And uh, he then suddenly flip flopped and became the carbon tax candidate. Uh, and uh, we don't need that kind of flip flopping. Uh, that, what that actually does is costs us the election because voters then don't believe in what we're saying. Um, they look at our agenda and say, well, you said one thing, but to become leader and now another afterwards. Um, and uh, so you can't be trusted with your uh, general election platform. Uh, and that's why I'm prom only promising things during the leadership race that I could fulfill both as leader and as prime minister. And just uh, to finish the third example I gave there, uh, what is your position on, on both CBC privatization and also the uh, $600 million media bailout fund that Justin Trudeau set up? Well, I will defund the CBC. Um, I'll have very specific proposals to do that as the leadership race unfolds. Um, and uh, that will, uh, you know, this is a colossal waste of money over a billion dollars uh, for a bloated uh, corporation that is becoming increasingly just a, a communications bureau for the PM, PMO. Uh, so I will defund CBC and I will have specific policy proposals to achieve that. Uh, I have always opposed um, subsidies for um, the media. I believe that um, media should make their earnings uh, by selling subscriptions, sponsorships, uh, advertising. Um, and that also, I, I believe that every media outlet um, should be treated equally. I don't think we should, the government should have a set of media po policies for favored media at the expense of others. I noticed that this current government seems to want to, to exclusively support the legacy media um, because most, most of it, not all, but most of the uh, Parliament Hill press gallery uh, is liberal, but they want to shut out um, the independent media voices, I, I take the opposite view. I think that every single media outlet uh, should have a fair chance to report the facts and inform Canadians. 
let's talk about some of the bigger picture issues that I've heard a lot of concerns about from conservative members and conservative supporters. And I, I'd say people that are potentially available to you as a leadership candidate seeking support in the next few months. And, and one big one, which admittedly I have talked about for years, and I think it's only in the last couple of months that it's gained a lot more traction, I, I think, outside of a, a small group of you know, people that have been working on it is uh, some of the, the global influences we see in a lot of Justin Trudeau's policy. And I, I want to be clear, I'm not talking about conspiratorial thinking here. I'm not talking about global cabals, but you do have, for example, the World Economic Forum, a group that Justin Trudeau and many people in his cabinet have actually promoted and actively participated in. We've got uh, the Great Reset, stakeholder capitalism, all of these things. And, and you've spoken out, I think, about some of these even on the floor of the House of Commons. I've had people that have said that you yourself are connected to the World Economic Forum. And I wanted to give you an opportunity to address this head on, because I'm sure you've seen it as well. Is there a connection there? Have you ever spoken at a World Economic Forum event? No, I have not. No, I, um, I've never been to Davos. I've never been part of the organization. And uh, I don't agree with its public po publicly stated policy objectives. Um, my policies are different. I obviously support um, small government, more freedom, uh, and individual independence. Uh, so the, I just have a fundamental disagreement with the organization's uh, policy outlook. And uh, that is uh, something that you can look at my track record. I've said that on the floor of the House of Commons. I said it in parliamentary committees. I've said it in comments that I've made online for years. So anybody who wants to know my position on that subject can simply check it out um, and look look up what I've actually said because I've been deadly consistent on that issue. Do you think that Justin Trudeau's government has been far too deferential, not just to the World Economic Forum, but in general, to some of these more internationalist bodies like the World Health Organization? You could include the WEF, the pursuit of the UN Security Council seat at, at great cost. Do you think that's a significant problem in Trudeau's government that you as prime minister would change course on? Um. Well, I think that he's just got the wrong idea uh, on foreign policy. He spent all kinds of money uh, and virtue signaled all around the world to try and get a UN Security Council seat. And then he didn't get it. He actually got fewer votes than I think Harper had received, even though Harper, one, had taken principled foreign policy stands and two, had uh, not spent all the money trying to buy international votes from dictators. So I would, uh, I would not have uh, gone down that road. I'm gonna take a principled foreign policy position and I'm not gonna go on, on vote buying ski, uh, schemes uh, that put taxpayers money out the window to try and win votes from dictators uh, at the UN. Let's talk about one consideration that a lot of people in leadership races do take very seriously, which is electability. I know it's the old William F. Buckley thing of you should vote for the most conservative, most electable candidate. Now, whether that guides a lot of people's views in Canadian conservative politics, I, I don't know. But there does seem to be this battle among conservative strategists that say, OK, well, we've got to break through in the so-called vote rich GTA or we've got to break through in Quebec. We can't just win on the red meat issues going after after the Alberta, Saskatchewan voters that are already there. I know it's early and you aren't yet the leader, but do you have a, a path to victory for that majority that you said you're going to win? And how do you get from step A of you running for leadership and step C of you being prime minister and, and make that vision happen? Well, it's pretty simple. People are going to vote in the next election on the cost of living. That's the issue. Uh, when I, Andrew, I've been elected seven times in a big city, Ontario riding. I am- Admittedly a fairly rural riding though, correct? Um, it's predominantly suburban. The population is predominantly suburban uh, in my riding. I have enormous suburbs like Stittsville, Finley Creek uh, and Riverside South. Finley Creek being a, uh, a slightly smaller one, but the, the two others are very big suburbs and they're all in the nation's capital. And I'm the only conservative to win this seat since 1984. I'm also the only conservative elected in the nation's capital. I twice got the biggest vote count of any candidate in all of Ontario. And when I was 25, I beat the defense minister um, to win the seat in the first place. Um, you know, Jean Charest has a record of losing. When he was a PC leader, he, has, he finished last, dead last. Five parties, 
he finished fifth behind the Liberals, behind the, the Reform Party, behind the NDP, and behind the Bloc Québécois. We don't need another last place finish, but that's what we'll get if he's the leader. Um, and uh, the reason for that is that his liberal policies are very unpopular. Um, and my conservative policies are very popular. That's why I win in the suburbs of Ontario, right? People are going to be voting on the following question. Who can make my paycheck go further so that my 32 year old son can move out of the basement and get his own house Who uh, so that I can buy gas and go where I need to get. And so I can afford nutritious food at the grocery store. I have a track record of lowering the cost of living. I voted to cut the GST and other taxes, and I'm the leading voice in Canada against inflation. Jean Charest has a track record of making life more expensive. He voted, he personally raised the sales tax, raised the fuel tax, raised the carbon tax, and uh, he uh, brought in a new health tax. So I think if, if we have a, a high tax, uh, ultra expensive leader, in the next election on the cost of living issue, we would get creamed um, in the Canada suburbs. I will win the suburbs by making, giving people control of their money and control of their lives so they can afford to get ahead. Is Quebec something that you would have a, a specific strategy to hopefully win votes in, or, or do you see yourself fitting into that Stephen Harper 2011 winning coalition that managed to get a majority without really having a breakthrough in Quebec? Well, I can win in Quebec. Um, uh, you know, I'm I'm probably the most winnable candidate uh, in this race for Quebec. More than the former premier of Quebec. Well, he lost. He got trounced in the most recent election where he ran as a liberal there. Um, and polling data still shows he's very unpopular in Quebec because people reject his high tax uh, record. Um, and uh, by contrast, I can appeal to the hardworking middle class entrepreneurial Quebecer that uh, can win us seats uh, right across the province, but in particular in Quebec City, around the Beauce, uh, Levy, uh, and, uh, and elsewhere, uh, where you see high, high levels of entrepreneurship, uh, working class people tired of paying high taxes. And I, I, my view on winning in Quebec is that we shouldn't try to blend in with the other parties. We should try to stand out, stand out as the only party that will fight inflation, the only party that fight that believes in low taxes, the only party that will go after gun criminals rather than law abiding and licensed hunters and farmers by standing separate from the, the left of center um, parties, we can, we can really uh, win the, uh, the support of a group of voters who, who've had no voice uh, at a federal level in that province. And, and that's what I intend to do. Just on the note of election readiness, we are in a, a minority government situation here, and the nature of those is that there could be an election at any point because the government falls, or we could see what happened in 2021, which is Justin Trudeau just wakes up one day and says, you know, I think the polling is right for me. Let's have an election now. But you've got to be ready to hit the ground running, and I know that you'll try to do your best to transition a leadership campaign into a general election campaign if you're successful. But would you be pushing for an election at the earliest available opportunity? Well, uh, my goal is to um, maximize the chance that we get a new and different government after the next election. So um, I, I'm not going to give Justin Trudeau a heads up on my precise strategy, but uh, having been part of Stephen Harper's two minority governments and a part of the opposition in 2004 to the Martin government, I have a lot of experience with minorities and I know how to plan a parliamentary strategy that will allow us to, to defeat Trudeau at the right time in a confidence vote and defeat him soon after in an election. So you're not worried about going up against Trudeau, even though he's, he's defeated three conservative leaders, you think you can be the ones to turn that around? I will beat Justin Trudeau. Pierre Polyev, conservative leadership candidate, will certainly touch base with you again as you go through the campaign, but I do appreciate your time today, sir. Great to be with you. Thanks very much. 
Pierre Polyev. And as I mentioned at the top, we're going to do this with all of the candidates. We're going to invite them at least. I don't know if all of them are going to do it. I certainly hope they do. And we won't have a repeat of the Peter McKay situation of 2020. But again, we move onward. We move upward. My thanks again to Pierre Polyev. We will talk to you soon. This is Canada's most irreverent talk show. More coming up in the days ahead here on True North. Thank you. God bless and good day. Thanks for listening to The Andrew Lawton Show. Support the program by donating to True North at www.tnc.news.